There once was a movie that angered a wife. Another, she gasped, not on your life. About a legacy aimed towards the kids and a retelling that just took the piss. It featured a hat that was worn by a cat, but soon enough, we'll get to all that. Oh boy, we've certainly stumbled into something here. Trends are trends when it comes to movies, and even though it seems when something sticks, it feels like it'll never go away, sometimes these trends do eventually die. It just takes them all being complete disasters every single time they're tried. And one such example of a terrible trend is the nauseatingly weird productions behind the early 2000s live action craze. For whatever reason, all sorts of old IPs were being given the brush up treatment with some debatably unprepared CGI to pump those old icons into a new live action format, whether they're old TV shows, video game adaptations, or beloved children's books. Whatever the case, it was time to make some real money out of kids' content, which brings us to the nostalgic disaster piece that ended an era, the Cat in the Hat live action film. Now, much like many people on the internet around about now, I too find this film to be incredibly nostalgic. See, I may now have a better taste in movies these days, but when I was a little kid, I too was swept up by pure spectacle. And this film certainly has that in droves. It's to the point that this is one of those films I can just remember the entire sound of. I would literally play this in the background as I went to sleep as a kid. But this film was released way back in 2003, and I haven't seen it in a good long while. Now, I don't particularly remember laughing out loud at any certain points, but I must have enjoyed it somewhat to want to play it on repeat, right? So let's go and open up this enigma of a film and see just what kind of joy it can give us, shall we? So, I gotta admit, this opening credits and main theme honestly isn't too bad. It feels like a direct rush of nostalgia, and it seems like the start of a genuine classic movie. Until... So the movie starts off at the Humber Flubes real estate office, where the mum of our story works. Again, I'm actually pretty impressed by just how stunning the actual set design is. Obviously, Dr. Seuss has some pretty great cartoony designs, but seeing the set designers recreate it in live action here is something I can't really fault. Shame the same can't be said for the rest of the crew. So the mum, Joan, needs to find a new babysitter for her kids. But first, we've got a staff meeting with Mr. Humber Flube himself. Mr. Humber Flube, I wanted to thank you. Man, this guy was really ahead of his time. So he tells us that Joan here is hosting the company's bi-monthly meet and greet event at her place, and with him being such a clean freak, her job is on the line to make sure everything is as clean as possible. And so our story conflict can start. Moving on, we meet Joan's kids. One of them is prepped, methodical, and unspontaneous, whilst the other is chaotic and messy. Complete opposites of each other, and technically both negative traits. Before anything starts, we get to see the two flex their traits, with the son, Conrad, setting up to slide down the stairs, while sister Sally watches disapprovingly. I think, ironically, I'm more invested in the several cutaways to their dogs doing little tricks to feign the idea of it reacting to events. I mean, I bet the crew probably sank so much time into getting these shots absolutely perfect, and I didn't even care one bit as a kid. So naturally, Conrad is caught and scolded for the events because that's about as predictable as it gets. Conrad tries to put some blame on Sally, but even as a kid, I just couldn't get invested into either of them. Joan tells the kids of her party plans and demands that the house is kept clean for the evening, and then this guy shows up. Does someone lose a dog? Yes, the early 2000s was Alec Baldwin's phase of popping in weird live-action kid adaptations, like Thomas the Tank Engine. That's a thing. What a career. This is Larry Quinn, returning the escaped dog who really had the best idea the whole time, honestly. Larry is the pompous neighbour who hates Conrad and is seemingly alright with Sally. And really, I can't blame him. But then the early 2000s tropes start popping up, with Joan clearly looking more and more seduced by Larry's words and conspicuously polishing the table off screen. I know how hard it is, Joan. It is hard. Oh. I know. Until he interrupts the moment to push a military school for troubled youth plan. Yeah, cause just disliking Conrad isn't enough, Quinn's whole conflict is him trying to literally send Conrad away for military training. Though it's never really explained quite why or when Quinn first started hitting Conrad. It, it's just his 
antagonistic goal, okay? I heard what you said. Why? Why would you do that? What is this shot? So he leaves and Joan is swamped with party prep but is sent back to work. So instead she sets up a new babysitter, Mrs. Kwan, looking like some sort of cupcake version of Edna Mode. As Joan leaves, she sets up some rules to not enter the living room or else and Conrad then stands up and proclaims, I wish I had a different mom. Well, sometimes I wish the same thing. I mean, come on! This movie plays it off here like Joan's in the wrong here, but as a baby kid watching this film, I still thought what she said was perfectly fair. And Conrad deserves to be beaten down like this. What was he expecting? I may have only been like seven at the time, but I could still smell when something was, uh, shall we say fishy. With the kids left with the babysitter, boredom strikes. Mrs. Kwan pops on some entertainment, Taiwanese parliament fights. You know, I think we can count our blessings there's no modern live adaptation, because 20 years later and it looks like Kwan's entertainment hasn't changed all that much. No more big government. <laughs> and if you're a regular, you know the drill, just now with my face actually saying it. If you're liking this content so far, then do consider subscribing. I'm hoping to do more with this green screen in the future, and it should be very nice. And only you can help unbalance my unbalanced sub ratio count. I always get that take wrong when I'm actually recording, so it's a miracle I did it right now. But yeah, 90% are unsolved, so any help would be great. Thanks. Then something went bump. How that bump made them jump. What could possibly be worse than a visit from Trump? So the kids suspensefully explore the noise upstairs, only to fake out the audience for a second time until... A monster? Where? <laughs> that could have gone better. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 I think you look perfectly fine. Naturally, the kids scream and run, as is the correct response, until eventually they listen to what he has to say. But it just... Everything he says just comes out so sadly forced. All his quips are surface level jokes. He's constantly looking directly at the camera with no real motivation for it other than being a character trait rather than an opportunity for real comedy. And that laugh. <laughs> that constant forced laugh just makes you want to sigh in defeat for how put on his entire character feels. With every extra wink to the audience, it really just feels like the film is just shouting at you to laugh. You get it? Cause this is the... <laughs> so as the kids are trying to get some answers, the cat in the hat just constantly gives us these unfunny interruptions. First it's about where did he come from, then about lactose intolerance, then he slides down the stairs in a real unconvincing manner, then he spouts more of that early 2000s adult tension with several adult jokes in a kids movie, and then he talks about why babysitters need to sit on babies. I I've been into enough comedy clubs to know this is some amateur material. Plus, knowing it's Mike Myers, I just can't unhear the Shrek in his voice. You pay this woman to sit on babies? That's disgusting! But at least from now, things can finally start moving with the Phonometer, which can read the personalities of the kids. Is it weird to say I kind of feel like this moment could fit into those unintentional ASMR in movies compilations? Even though it's intentionally goofy. Also, here's another adult joke. You can tap it with a hammer. It ain't gonna change. Followed by one that kids simply won't understand. That'll be $700. Who's your insurance carrier? And then after being told the cure is either a musical or shots, Sally turns around with... How many shots? You know, it really says something when your main comic relief isn't the funniest character. So the musical begins, the kids hate it and so do I, and then the fish starts talking. It's out of nowhere, it isn't established well, it looks horrendous, and hey, it's voiced by Joan's boss. I never knew. And just like that, his grievances are left behind. Oh, and now it's a Cats musical cut. And while I'd love to say this is your classic boomer pleaser with its presentation, I've also got to give it props, because it's kind of that doofy fun you'd expect with a song about fun. I just wish it didn't have to end so predictably with a milk burp explosion. Still, the kids loved it, so he's allowed to stay. And first on the agenda is something magical the cat wants to show to them. It's called a contract. I honestly really like this joke. Who are they? 
Magical time traveling elves. <laughs> and you had to ruin it. Still, thematically, only now did I realize this is partially about Sally trying to be spontaneous as she wrote ironically in her to-do list earlier on. So the contract is signed and the day can begin, but not before some couch adjustments with an American mechanic archetype. I'd shoot down yet another butt fuck sound effects joke, but I legitimately have a memory of repeatedly rewinding this section because the soundscape to me was so funny. What a sad revelation. Though there's a good hint of a joke here with it being a costume that isn't logical to the cat's furry anatomy, I guess. Uh. So after some generic convincing and pointless flashback gag, the kids end up bouncing on the couch only to be caught by an intruding Larry Quinn, who not only antagonizes both kids now, but reveals his true form as a slob for no real reason other than to shoot his own foot, I guess? Now they both dislike him, his whole cornering Conrad idea is ruined. Whatever, he's allergic to cats, so soon enough is forced out the house among a slew of unconvincing sneezes. Brr, moving on, it's time for cupcakes. Don't ask why. And it's all presented as some sort of kitchen show, with one cat pretending to be British from Cheshire. Don't ask why. They rattle on with a anything joke. Anything. Anything. Yes, anything. <laughs> anything. Anything. They threaten murder, they insult your wife, and they chop off their own tail with a resounding SON OF A bitch. Again, much like most of this film, just don't ask why. Just sit through it all, alright? But I like the immediate after effect. Look, I'm not saying we're going to sue. I'm just saying we have a case. Until it plays it off like the audience showed up. So the oven explodes with purple cake mix and the dog reacts too. Man, why you gotta splatter the dog? Who came up with the idea to genuinely throw gunk onto the dog for a shot? That's heartbreaking! So Sally forces the cat to start cleaning up and he does so by destroying Joan's dress. Honey, it was ruined when she bought it. Yeah. <sighs> with a new plan, Cat now introduces Thing 1 and Thing 2. We're halfway through this film at this point and now a hint of a plot can actually begin. And these things are horrifyingly fast, like a couple of Oompa Loompas on crack, but we'll see that soon enough. Conrad wants to see inside the crate, the trans-dimensional transporter later, but Cat doesn't allow it and locks it with a crab padlock. Though hey, there's a hint of a good joke here with the Philippines. But it says made in the Philippines. Yes, but not this Philippines. Look. Seriously, subtlety can go such a long way over all of this. So the things clean Joan's dress by splattering it onto the couch, and to clean the couch, they, uh... Yep, this is horrifying. So the things just go nuts, destroying the house and attacking the kids too. I like the gag on the babysitter sleeping through everything, but otherwise it's borderline demonic. Amidst the madness, Conrad unlocks the crate and lets the padlock free, and as a hint of help, Cat tells the kids that the things always do the opposite of what you say, a perfect theme for Conrad. And that'd be kind of cool if they didn't explain it so obtusely. Why do they always do the opposite? Remind you of anyone, Conrad? Zinga! <laughs> zinga, zinga! I mean, this is literally predicting some Big Bang Theory energy, you know? Regardless, the dog is then thrown out the window and the crate is suffering because of it. This is the actual main conflict of the film. It just took 40 minutes to get there. This crate, by the way, is all original content for the film, so naturally, it's all downhill from here. Also, Larry Quinn's sloppy behavior is revealed in his rundown house. He's been hiding his beer belly, he has no money, and he's spotted Nevins the dog running down the road again. How exactly he expects to keep this secret when together with Joan later down the line, I have absolutely no idea. Though apparently they're already dating, so, huh? Still, the kids are on an adventure to get Nevin's back. The cat characteristically interrupts the progress with a musical gag that I probably wouldn't hate if it wasn't Cat in the Hat, and the fish too gets his moment. To just completely fall flat on his face. After spending too long climbing a fence, we're then stopped again for another gag. Dirty ho. Come on, cat. And they end up at a kid's birthday party. I like the genuine little moments of Sally realizing it's everyone she knows and she wasn't invited because of her actions, but with it being the moral of the story, it sure is sprinkled in thinly and barely threads the whole thing together. In reality, the film is much more attached to the bonkers spectacle and the lol random comedy. So in an admittedly iconic moment, Cat disguises himself as a piñata and that goes about how you'd expect. 
Hey look, the dog dropped the sausage. I appreciate that. So Quinn nabs the dog before the kids get to it, and they follow soon afterwards in Cat's car. This joke isn't too bad. This one. It's better than the last name we had. Super hydraulic instantaneous transporter. Oh, you mean it. No! Even a kid could string together. I did. I can't believe you whizzed up my taco! <laughs> I'm keeping that line, thank you. So after a couple more lame comments and gags and one good one, they eventually reach Larry as he goes to the real estate office. They trick him with a prop I like the sound of, and as Larry doesn't actually use it with two hands, they run away with the dog in hand. And so now they dive into a secret underground daytime party? What is going on? Is that Paris Hilton? Was she even relevant in 2003? Uh, oh. She was very relevant in 2003. Literally two weeks before the film released, apparently. Yikes. So one disposable scene later, and apparently they're at an impasse, even though they've got what they wanted to and the things are still a thing. D does Joan's car seriously have the number plate FAP505? You gotta be kidding me. So they're stopped by the things doing their thing, and Larry chases on bike instead. Meanwhile, the house is played with early 2000s CG bubbles. That's a really weird cut. The cat disappears and Larry is clearly seen hiding. And as Larry pops up to confront them, they discover a spotless house. The cat comes to surprise him and Larry falls into the depths of the mother of all messes. And though it's a disaster, supposedly, you gotta admit it's pretty good looking too. There's a reason I chose this as my background picture. Though, is this meant to be a mess just for the house? Or is this gonna bleed out into the rest of the world? This is unexplained. So they go off to shut the crate that surely wouldn't work because everyone's already out of it, right? And they ride Mrs. Kwan like a water ride. You mean like at Universal Studios? <laughs> <Cha -ching. laughs> <sighs> and knowing how much Mike Myers hated being in this film and was contractually forced by Universal Studios only makes this more sad. So they finally reach the crate that'll turn the house back to normal conveniently. Things are, for some reason, disappearing at the top of the vortex, and Conrad finally shuts the crate by dropping Sally into said vortex. And so the house warps back and self-destructs in the process, and Larry is dropped outside. The kids are furious and the cat's antics are no longer funny, as if they ever were. And the cat is banished away. So with everything a disaster, the kids finally decide to take the blame for it all. With Sally refusing to hide upstairs where she won't be blamed, though, hey look, she actually tells a genuinely funny reasoning. I'm not going upstairs, I'm staying with you. Two reasons. One, the stairs are destroyed. I'm telling you, she's the highlight of this film. And the morals have been learned. And so because of that last point, the cat drives in with a whole new machine, another song to sing, and announcing that if they learn from their mistakes, then the contract allows everything to be sorted. Cue the montage of cleaning up the total destruction. Is that Smash Mouth singing in the background? Well, isn't that just absolutely perfect? And so as the montage continues, every element is clean picked. The dog is dropped and exploited again, and Joan makes her way closer and closer. So the last thing to check is that ASMR phenometer again that's a little less effective the second time round. And all is well. And with a thankful goodbye, the cat leaves and Joan gets Phineas and Ferb syndrome of a perfect house. And as a final victory, Larry storms in all covered in goo, rambles about the reality that just passed, and is subsequently rejected and kicked out. Though Joan defends Conrad as being a good kid, which considering everything Joan has actually seen, I don't actually buy, but whatever. The party goes on, the boss approves, though technically he's not following social distancing rules like a real germaphobe, and the cupcakes are a surprise hit with the guests. And as a final send-off to the end of this film, Joan joins the kids in bouncing on the couch uncharacteristically the next day, and it's revealed our couplet rhyming narrator has been the cat all along, though actually it's not, which is kind of a scam on us. And the cat and things wander into the sunset, never to be seen again, even though they went into the box. What an acid trip of a film. And of course our credits are underlaid with a performance by Smash Mouth once again. There were hopes for a sequel to this disaster piece, but with Mike Myers' gripes and the just immoral executive decisions to turn this innocent source material into a softcore innuendo fest, the idea was soon flattened. And the wife of Dr. Seuss was so angered by the production that she disallowed the production of any future live action films ever again. And really, what a saint she must be. 
This film is beyond goodwill and is just savagely whizzing on the taco that is a beloved legacy with shallow references to bring in a larger audience. And I didn't even mention all the weird edits and terrible dubbing clearly mashed onto the film later on. And then there's all the deleted scenes that just get worse and worse. I mean, they gagged the poor dog. This franchise died with Universal Studios and I couldn't be happier because of it. As a kid, I somewhat enjoyed this film. There was some spectacle to enjoy, but I also didn't have a large library to play when I was younger. I didn't find the cat funny. I think I just liked the pretty colors at most. Everything else was just a shut off brain and something moving on screen. But with this final watch, I can bury the film's memory into the abyss of my brain. Nostalgic as it may be, it is evil. From a contractual obligation standpoint, from a corrupting audience perspective, and from simply disrespecting the works of one of the greatest child writers of all time. I feel bad for everyone involved in the production, but I'm happy to forget this ever happened. I didn't see a thing. I never saw a thing at all. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. <sighs> of all films that I've got the entire audio track of just enlarged into my long-term memory, it has to be this one that's just in there. I can't, I can't get rid of it, but at least I can forget the film once and for all after this. But yeah, and let me know what you think of this formula. I might try some more green screen stuff. I got a whole bunch of setups going on, so we'll see. I can't believe you whizzed on my taco.